hello. Uh, first, first things first. I know it's been a super long day, and there have been like uh, very cognitively intensive talks, which I have loved. Um, but everyone should just stand up for a second because it's it's just like been a lot of time sitting, and just like do a little do a little shake. Uh, you're gonna feel a lot better, <laughs> uh, and I'm and I'm less likely to put you to sleep that way. Is is what I figure. Great, thank you. Thank you very much for doing that. <laughs> I'm sure you feel better, right? Okay, stay hydrated too. It's gonna be it's gonna be a long talk. No, I promise. I won't go over the full hour. Okay. Okay, uh, so yes, so this is uh, The Expanding Dark Forest and Generative AI. Uh, this was an essay I wrote um, about, oh, back in January? So like five years ago in like AI, in AI time. Um, and I've kind of expanded it into a little more comprehensive understanding of uh, what we're about to face down with generative AI. So uh, this is mostly going to be about writing on the web, uh, trust, and, and human relationships. So, you know, like really small topics, uh, and sadly, also AI. Uh, I apologize. Um, a small footnote is that this talk is up to date as of about two weeks ago. Um, so that means almost everything that I'm going to say is perhaps completely irrelevant by this point. I have essentially gathered some thoughts that relate to a moment that has like just whooshed past us. So uh, that's inevitable in, the, in this uh, industry. First, a little bit of context is um, I am obviously Maggie, uh, and I want to lay out all my biases up front. Um, I am a designer uh, at an AI research lab called Oort. Uh, we make tools that use language models to augment and expand human reasoning. In practice, this means we mostly make research tools for academics and for large organizations. Oh, like NGOs, I just skipped to the wrong slide. Sorry, we're back. Uh, I'm not going to touch that again. <laughs> um, to help them understand the scientific literature and make decisions. Second uh, is that I am what we call very online. Uh, this means uh, I live on Twitter. I know this is a Mastodon crowd, but sadly, I'm one of the bad people on Twitter. Um, I write a lot online. I hang out with other people who do the same. And we all kind of like write blog posts and essays to each other, like we're like 18th century men of letters. Uh, and this has led to lots of like friends and collaborators and wonderful jobs. Like I have had an overwhelmingly positive experience of being a sincere human on the web. And I really want other people to have that experience. Uh, and lastly, um, before I joined tech, uh, I studied cultural anthropology. Um, and I think this sometimes can give me a useful perspective, a uh, set of frameworks and tools for me to think about how uh, culture and society um, behaves on the web, a little bit like social behavior. Uh, this is a logistical note. This QR code, if you scan it with your phone, will uh, take you to all my like slides and notes and links for this presentation. So like you don't have to worry about like taking photos or like writing down paper names as I'm going. I'm going to reference a lot of stuff. Um, there's also a roughly accurate transcript on there, although it like falls apart on the second half because I didn't have time to to like make it nice right before I came up here. But it will be nicer later, uh, and I'll show this again at the end. Uh, and it's also on this URL, maggieappleton.com/forestalk. Okay. So here's what I'm going to talk about. Um, first, I'm going to explain what dark forest theory of the web is. Uh, I'm then, go then going to talk about the state of generative AI, you know, as of two weeks ago. Uh, I'm going to then ask, like, uh, is this actually a problem? I'm going to lay out some like hypothetical problems, and then we can question if they were valid or not. Uh, and then finally, I want to talk about possible futures and how we might deal with these hypothetical problems. Uh, so first, to explain the dark forest theory of the web, I first have to explain the dark forest theory of the universe. Uh, so this theory tries to explain why we haven't found intelligent life in the universe yet. So here we are, right, with the pale blue dot. Uh, and we are out here thinking that we're the only intelligent life that we've found. Uh, and we've been beaming out messages, trying to find other intelligent life, for over 60 years at this point. And we haven't heard anything back. So the big question is, like, why? <laughs> Where is everyone else? So dark forest theory says that the universe is like a dark forest. Uh, it's a place that seems eerily quiet and lifeless. Um, but the reason for that is that if you make a lot of noise in the universe, the predators come eat you. Uh, so if you draw attention to yourself, you're going to be attacked and destroyed. Uh, so it stands to reason uh, that all the other intel intelligent civilizations either died out or learned to shut up. Uh, and we don't know which of those we are yet. So the web version builds off this concept. Uh, it's a theory that was proposed by Yancey Strickler in 2019. Uh, he wrote this article. And he described some of the trends and shifts of what it feels like to be in public spaces on the web. So Yancey pointed out that we have two main vibes that are going on. Uh, the first is that being in public spaces on the web at the moment can often feel quite lifeless and automated and devoid of humans. 
Um, so here we are, a little individual on the web. And we naively start to write a bunch of very sincere and authentic accounts of our lives and thoughts and experiences. And we are trying to find other intelligent people who share our beliefs and share our interests. Um, but it, when we look around, it feels like we're surrounded by content that doesn't feel very authentic and human. It feels like a bunch of bots and marketing automations and growth hackers are just pumping out this kind of generic clickbait content, and they have ulterior motives to us. We have all seen this stuff. This is like low quality listicles, like productivity rubbish, like growth hacking advice, banal motivational quotes, like dramatic clickbait. It's stuff that feels like it may as well be automated, and it's rarely trying to communicate kind of sincere, original thoughts and ideas to other humans, right? It's just trying to get you to click and rack up views. So this like, kind of overwhelming flood of low quality content has made a lot of us retreat away from public spaces on the web because it's just like very costly to spend time and energy wading through this stuff. So the second vibe of the dark forest is that there is a lot of unnecessarily antagonistic behavior at a very large scale. So when we are putting out signals, right, trying to connect with other authentic humans, we risk becoming a target. Specifically, like the Twitter mob might come eat us. So there's a term on Twitter called getting main character. Does people know what this is? This is? Yeah. <laughs> um, so every day, uh, there is one main character on Twitter, and your goal is to not be that character. Uh, so they usually get piled on for saying the wrong thing or for not considering how their word's going to be taken out of context. Um, I've actually had some close friends get main character for, like, frankly, very banal, like, boring things. Uh, and it's really quite, quite harmful to their mental health. Um, so a good example was, I don't know if people remember Garden Lady from October. Uh, this is just last year. This woman tweeted this really lovely thing about like how she and her husband sit in the garden every morning and just chat over coffee for hours. And she, like, she loves him so much. Like, how nice? How nice is this, right? What do you think Twitter did? Uh, so in the, in the comments, we got, that's cool. I wake up every morning and fight my way through traffic for an hour in Miami to get to work. Must be nice. Um, I wake up at 6 a.m., shower, and go to work for a shift that is a minimum of 10 hours long. This is an unattainable goal for most people. Oh, this one kind of goes on for a bit and then just goes, it must be nice to be a trust fund baby with not a care in the world. So, as usual, <laughs> people on Twitter take things in the best possible light. Um, and this, summed, this TikTok summed it up well, is I don't really care if something good happened to you, it should have happened to me instead. So. This is like really a dumb example, but it's very indicative of the energy flows uh, of specifically Twitter, but also broadly of a lot of our media environments at this point, right? Publishing to the open web can make you a target for criticism, but it's very rarely the constructive kind. Um, so things that you say will very often be taken in bad faith, they will be taken out of context, and they can be amplified to very unintended audiences, right? Like this is how we get canceling and pylons. Uh, John Ron Ronson wrote an entire book on this. Uh, it's called You've Been Publicly Shamed. Uh, and he points to a lot of very um, real examples of people who've kind of had their lives destroyed by being canceled or piled on by social media. Obviously, sometimes it's very justified. They say something that is like very um, unacceptable, but like none of us really want them to, to be speaking in public anymore. Um, but it ends up having, yeah, very material consequences. People lose jobs, they're alienated from their communities, they uh, suffer a lot of uh, emotional trauma. And so this makes the public web a sincerely dangerous place to publish your true thoughts, right? And most of us choose not to engage. But then this makes it hard to find people, right, who are being sincere, who are seeking coherence, who are trying to build collective knowledge in public. Um, I know this is not what everyone wants to do with the web. Like some people just want to watch funny TikTok dance videos or, or like unboxing stuff on YouTube, uh, and that's completely fine. Um, I'm just interested in at least some parts of the web enabling this kind of productive discourse and community building. I'm expecting a lot of people here feel the same. Um, so rather than it being this like threatening, inhuman place where nothing is taken in good faith, we want to try to find an alternative. So how do we cope with this, right? We're all like wandering around the dark forest of like Facebook and LinkedIn and Twitter, and most of us realize we need to go somewhere that's a little bit safer. So what we end up doing is we retreat, um, primarily to what's called the cozy web. So this was a term coined by Venkatesh Rao in direct response to the dark web, web theory. And Venkat pointed out that we've all started to go underground, as it were. We move to semi-private spaces, like newsletters and personal websites, where we're less at risk of attack. 
But even these things, personal websites and newsletters, uh, are sometimes a little bit too public. You can still get amplified in a way you didn't intend to. So we retreat even further into gate-kept public chats like Slack, Discord, WhatsApp. And this is where we spend most of our time, right? We are trying to just have like real human relationships and express our ideas, and these are much safer spaces. Um, everything we say can kind of be taken in good faith, and we can actually engage in discussions and help have our minds changed on things that we might be wrong about. Um, the problem is, obviously, none of this is indexed or searchable, right? We are like hiding our collective knowledge in these private databases that we don't own or control. Uh, and like, good luck searching for anything on Discord. Um, so sadly, my current theory <laughs> is that this dark forest part of the web is about to expand quite a lot um, because poof, generative AI. <laughs> Um, yeah, so generative AI uh, is a phrase that refers to essentially machine learning models um, that can generate content um, that before this point in history only humans can make. Uh, this is primarily text, images, video, and audio. Uh, so here are some of the very popular models that I'm sure you've heard of for each media type, right? Like GPT-4 and Claude for text, Midjourney and Stable Diffusion for images. Most people haven't really heard of like the audio stuff as much, but it's out there. This is obviously ChatGPT, like we have all seen a thousand screenshots of this at this point, right? So this is a large language model that can generate huge volumes of text in seconds, human-like text. Uh, and I'm going to assume a fair amount of knowledge about language models in this crowd, mostly because like previous speakers handily did it for me. Um, but the key points for us to remember are that they output text that is generally indistinguishable from human-made text. We kind of usually say they write at like a high school essay level. I will definitely get into the flaws of like language model text later, uh, but we should acknowledge that these outputs are like astonishingly good most of the time. Um, they are trained on huge volumes of text that were primarily scraped from the English-speaking web. I'll talk about that more later. Um, and all they really do is try to predict the next word in a sequence, right? Given these 2,000 characters, like what do you think comes next? Um, and that sounds simple, but then it leads to all kinds of complex and potentially useful behavior. We can also now generate images, right? These are ones from Midjourney, which is kind of the more aesthetic of all the, of all the image generators. Uh, and this is a video. I'm going to see if this plays. We're going to find out. Hello, Causal Islands. I'm a pretty creepy fake person, but pretty soon it'll be hard to distinguish me from a real person. Yeah, creepy, hey? Uh, little uncanny valley still at this point. Um, I'm not actually going to focus a lot on video and image in this talk. Um, I'm just going to focus mostly on language models and text. Um, deep fakes are definitely a problem. Um, I'm just like all fill up on problems, so like someone else will need to do that talk. All right, so by now, um, language models have turned uh, into lots of very easy to use products, right? You don't really need any technical skills to use them. So these are a bunch of like very popular copywriting apps that are out there in the world, like Jasper, Copy AI, Moonbeam. Um, they are mostly directed at marketers. Um, here's kind of how they work. So this is like an article generator. You type in what you want to write about. So I've said here, write like, why carbon credits are ineffective. Like, I know absolutely nothing about carbon credits. I have no idea if they're actually effective or not. So I'm just going to have this model like write the thing for me. So it turns out 700 words on it, right? And they're, they're actually kind of OK. They're a bit generic. But it's ready for me to publish, right? And it does argue that these carbon credits are ineffective. Um, and if I'm someone lobbying against carbon credits, this is like quite handy. You know, I can like generate a hundred of these and then like optimize them for certain Google keyword search terms and like shove them on the web, right? Like hard days advocacy done. Um, quality and truthfulness the, of this is like clearly very questionable, but we'll get into that in a minute. Um, but the point is that this is incredibly easy to do at this point with, with no technical skills. Obviously, it's not just limited to blog posts and articles. Any text that can be generated will. So here, it gives you an array of, of convenient formats, like um, presenting yourself on a dating site or writing your wedding vows, or uh, sharing tips and knowledge, which clearly are not going to be based off anything that you've actually learned. Um, and there's every manifestation of this, right? We have tweet generators. We have LinkedIn post generators. You can turn YouTube videos into tweets and vice versa, right? Anything, uh, any kind of content is quite reusable. Uh, obviously, this is all like a marketer's dream. Uh, and so most of the examples uh, and tools I've shown are actually have quite a simple architecture. Um, they are made by feeding a single input, or what we call a prompt, into this big black mystery box of a language model. Uh, I've drawn it as a black box here because we actually don't know much about how they reason or produce their answers. Like Even the creators, we really don't understand how they work. 
Um, so yeah, big, big mystery box. Um, but anyway, we get a single output, right? And that's like an image or some text or, or an article or whatever we asked for. And we can scale it up to many outputs, right? Most of the companies who make language models have an API we can hit, so you can make you know, 1,000 or 100,000 articles. Um, but we're still quite limited in how sophisticated we can get with this kind of like single input, single output architecture. But we've recently started to see much more sophisticated ways of prompting language models show up. So um, one of the most promising is called prompt, uh, prompt chaining uh, or composition. Um, Ort has been doing research on this for a couple years, but there's a new library called LangChainout that's made this very popular and very easy to do. Um, and this approach uh, ends up solving a lot of flaws or like weaknesses in language models. So usually, right, uh, they lack a lot of knowledge about recent events. They aren't always accurate, right? You'll hear they hallucinate. Um, they don't do maths well. They like lack long-term memory. They can't interact with the rest of our digital worlds. Um, but prompt chaining solves quite a lot of these. Um, so the way that this works is uh, you get a, a language model core and you set it up to act in a loop with a bunch of external tools. So you give it a goal, which is like your input prompt. Uh, and then you tell it, like, I want you to observe and reflect on what you know at each stage and like, reflect on your goal. So it, uh, you know, it thinks a bit, uh, and then it decides on a course of action that it thinks will help move it towards uh, its, uh, its final goal. And it picks from a set of available tools. Some of these might be searching the web. It can write and run code. You can get it to query a database. You can use a calculator. You can hit an API. You can connect it to Zapier or IFTTT. Um, and after each time it does one of these action steps, it then reflects on what it's learned and it picks another action. And like on and on it goes until it reaches what it thinks is an acceptable output. And so doing this makes, uh, allows us to um, get much more sophisticated answers uh, out of a single uh, language model call. Um, it's like much more accurate. It's able to do much more complex tasks. Um, you'll also notice that this mimics a very basic version of how humans reason, right? This is a little bit like an OODA loop, um, orient, um, obs no, observe, orient, decide, and act. Um, it's, it's a very simple version of that. So some people have taken this further. Um, this is a paper that came out just over two weeks ago uh, on this new concept called generative agents. Um, so what they did here was they made a sim game, you know, like the sims where the people are like playing in the houses, um, except for each sim, they um, backed them by a language model architecture that was very similar to what we saw with, with the um, prompt chaining. Um, except it looked a little bit like this. Um, they added some extra things. It has a long-term memory database that they can read and write to. The um, little sims can like reflect on their experience and like log what they're doing every day. They can plan on what to do next, and they can of course like interact with other sims in the game. So they let this run for two days, uh, and they saw a lot of interesting stuff. Uh, it produced kind of very compelling and believable human behaviors. Um, these little agents would go about their day like cooking breakfast, and if it was burning, they would like take it off the stove. They would chat to one another. They would form opinions. They would reflect on their life. Uh, and then they also showed uh, a lot more like emergent social behavior. Um, so they told the, the Sims or one of them like, okay, you're going to plan a Valentine's Day party. And then that Sim like told all the other, invited them all. And then they all like showed up on time. And one of the other Sims like asked another Sim out on a date to the Valentine's Day party. Like they really had quite, uh, quite incredible stuff. Um, so this is crazy, uh, like, uh, but also a little bit terrifying. Um, and it's also because there's a new kind of like this agent driven architecture that's becoming quite popular. There's a new library called Agent GPT that just came out a few weeks ago. Again, this has all just happened in the last like five seconds. Um, and it now makes it quite easy to spin up agents very similar to this, but then they can also perform actions on the web. They are like, very much a part of our existing informational ecosystems, but have a lot of agency all on their own. Uh, distressing. Um, so I think we're about to enter a stage of sharing the web with a lot of non-human agents. Um, they're going to be very different to what we currently consider bots. Um, they're going to have a lot more data on how to act like a realistic human, and I think they're rapidly going to get more and more capable. Uh, and soon we're not going to be able to tell the difference between one of these agents and a human, like very, very soon. Um, I'm going to say sharing, sharing the web with these agents I don't think it's going to be inherently bad, uh, right? They could have lots of good use cases, like they could be automated moderators, they could be search assistants. But uh, suffice to say, it's going to be complicated. <laughs> um, so now, now we get to talk about why this is a problem, OK? Um, so I'm only going to fo focus on how this is going to affect um, human relationships and information on the web. Um, anything else, like how we might all end up in unemployed or like dead very soon, is like far beyond my pay grade. So I'm going to leave that out. OK, so um, the thing that's changed is that the cost of creating and publishing content to the web just dropped to almost zero. Like, 
humans, <laughs> we are really quite expensive and slow at making content, right? We need time to research and think, and then we like clumsily string together words. And then we want to take a break because we want to sleep and we want to eat and we want to shower. And then we demand people pay us like extortionate hourly rates for our time. Like we're very inconvenient as content creators. Um, whereas generative models, they are way faster. They don't need time off. They don't get bored. Um, ChatGPT, um, which is like one of the more popular and accessible models, um, it costs a fraction of a cent to generate a thousand tokens, like 0, 0. 0.002, um, uh, which means that like making a hundred articles that are each a thousand words will cost you two cents. That's a that's a pretty cheap content creator. Obviously, if you use more sophisticated um, prompt chaining tactics, like the ones I use, that would be more expensive, but it's still, it's still within reasonable bounds. Um, and given that these creations are cheap and easy to use and fast and that you can produce a near infinite amount of content, I think we are about to drown in a sea of informational garbage. Like, I think we're going to be absolutely swamped by masses of mediocre content. I think every marketer and SEO optimizer and, and a uh, strategist bro is just going to have a field day filling Twitter and Facebook and LinkedIn and Google search results with just keyword stuffed opt optimized generated crap. Uh, this explosion of noise is going to make it very difficult to find good quality content and to hear the signal through this noise. Obviously, we do already have tools that deal with spam and they filter for low quality content, right? Like we're not going into this with, with nothing in our tool build. Um, but I think that they're a much more sophisticated type of content that we haven't seen before. And I think it's all going to leak through. Um, I expect within a couple of years, we'll like level up our content moderation, our filtering, our defense systems, and we'll find ways to deal with this. But then we're going to be in a, this strange in-between phase for the next year or two. Um, as a meta note, this image is made in mid-journey, and it's the only AI-generated image I'm using in this talk, but I just wanted to show that AI can do hands now, so like, clearly we've, we've made progress. <laughs> okay, um, you can tell that this is already happening uh, because spammers and scammers are lazy as fuck. Like, this is a recent Verge article pointing out that the phrase, as an AI language model, is showing up all over the place. So if you don't know, if you ask ChatGPT things, it often says, as an AI language model, I do not have a political opinion. Um, and now if you search this, it's like it's in Amazon reviews, it's in Yelp reviews, it's in tweets, it's in LinkedIn posts. It shows people just like copying and pasting ChatGPT straight into stuff, um, which means they couldn't even be bothered to like remove this obvious giveaway. And I think this indicates like how much care and detail they're going to put into all their future work. Um, so let's look at some hypothetical scenarios of how this might look. So this is Nigel, uh, and he's written a book called Why why nepotism is great. Um, let's, let's give him the benefit of the doubt, but like, he really wrote this book. He didn't generate it, okay? Uh, he wants to be a bookfluencer. So he spins up an agent, and he says to the agent, like, promote this, you know? Not unlike you would to a traditional book agent. Uh, and then he gives it access to like, all his social media accounts via APIs or Zapier. Um, and so the agent thinks for a bit, and it goes, okay, well, I'm going to uh, generate and schedule like, a steady stream of tweets based on your book content. And then I'm going to turn that into like optimized for LinkedIn and Facebook versions of that. And then let's write and schedule a newsletter that'll go out like every week for six months. And then we can turn that into like medium articles, which is great. Uh, and then I'll make some like really addictive TikTok videos based on your content, right? And I'll make like a 24 part series on YouTube of like mini essays. Um, and then I'm going to make a bunch of podcast episodes and use your voice. That's like actually very easy to do at this stage. Um, and then I'm going to find other people who write about nepotism. I'm going to comment on their stuff and like, you know, engage with the community. Um, and, you know, it, it's a grand success. Like Nigel's book gets a lot of attention. Um, and the thing is that like none of this is very different to what Nigel could do. Um, and the agent doesn't like make tons of content or right? it doesn't want to set off like content moderation flags. Oh, I don't know where the screen went. There we go. Um, it, you know, he doesn't want to like set off any content moderation or filtering stuff, so it, he tries to like look the same way that uh, Nigel would be making this stuff. Um, and like without an agent, 99% um, of people like Nigel wouldn't have the time and energy and motivation to do this. Like even though they could, even if they've written a book, uh, and they certainly couldn't do it with this like volume and consistency of output. So now instead of like 1% of people having the time and energy to be prolific self-promoters. Like, these people exist, we see them everywhere, right? Now, like, 99% of people have the capacity to be that kind of person. Um, obviously, like, we already, uh, as mentioned, we have a lot of spam on the web, and we're usually able to filter it out and ignore it, but I think the scale and quality of this new um, stuff that's going to be coming is something we're not prepared for. 
I think, and I also think like Nigel's agent, I expect to actually be quite good at, at writing the content it writes. I actually think it might be better than Nigel was. So like, there's no way that we're gonna be able to distinguish it by it being worse. Um, now let's imagine how this plays out um, with a political group who has like a very specific agenda to push. So this is Genetic Guardians. They are a bunch of lobbyists who strongly believe in gene editing uh, and they want to spread the good word. And they understand scale in a way that Nigel doesn't. So they spin up a thousand agents. Uh, and they tell them, like, go be influencers. Like, we want you to go um, look like you are real consistent people. And I want you to, you know, make accounts on most of the major social media platforms. And, like, they can have their own websites and Twitter accounts. And they're going to behave just like any other human on the web, right? We're not going to be able to tell the difference. But each influencer is, like, this one person, like, social media machine, right? Making engaging educational content about gene editing, right? They, like, publish books, and they're, like, making mini documentaries on YouTube, and, like, they have each other on their podcasts. Like, they, for all intents and purposes, look like they're just some, like, influencer, you know, content ring going on. <laughs> um, but again, they don't really set off moderation content flags because they don't look any different to the way normal humans would publish on the web. Um, and the gene guard genetic guardians, right, they just, like, get a ton of really great promotional content out of this. Um, this is all fairly doable right now. It would be quite expensive to spin up something like this, um, but we should expect costs to drop. Uh, and we also know there are like a lot of really well-funded political lobbying groups out there. I wouldn't be surprised if this is already happening. Okay, I do have some good news. So let's all like, take a breath, right? <sighs> yeah, good. Okay, it's all been a bit dark. Uh, it'll get a little bit darker, but then I promise, <laughs> uh, only a bit, only a bit. Okay, the good news is, okay, this might not be a problem. Like, this, this, it's possible. This is only going to be a problem if we want to use the web for very particular purposes. Okay, so if we want the web to like facilitate genuine human connections and relationships, or like to pursue collective sense making and knowledge building, or to like ground our knowledge in reality. <laughs> so if you don't care about any of these things, like don't worry, generative AI is gonna be fine, like you don't have anything to work about. <laughs> um, yeah, we're just gonna have like much more engaging content. Like TikTok's gonna be like a lot better. Um, so the thing is, I'm quite keen on some of these outcomes. Uh, like I write on the web a lot. I'm a big proponent of other people publishing their personal knowledge to the web. I encourage everyone to do it. I kind of like bang on about this thing called digital gardening, where you like have your own personal wiki on the web and you like put out lots of unfinished stuff. Um, and the whole point of that is, right, is to like make the sp web a space for collective understanding and knowledge building, right? This is something a ton of the other speakers have touched on, um, but that requires us to be able to like find and share and curate really high quality, reliable, insightful information. So I'm really quite worried that generative agents threaten a lot of that, at least in the short term, until we can like build up our defenses against them. So when I talk to my to people about my worries, uh, I always get this question, right? They're like, well. Why does it matter that like a generative model made something rather than a human, right? Like in most cases, language models, um, when they write things, it's actually they're more accurate and they're more knowledgeable than most humans. Like we have benchmarks that show this. Um, at least when it comes to referencing things that are quite well documented facts out on the web already. Like they're frankly better writers than a lot of us. Um, so surely, right? Like having more generated content on the web would actually make it a more reliable and valuable place for everyone, right? And like, I'm sympathetic to this point, like in theory. Um, but there are a few key differences between content generated by humans and generated by models. Um, the first is its connection to reality. The second is its social context. Uh, and finally, it's their potential for human relationships. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna go into each of these in detail. So first, generated content is different because it has a very different relationship to reality than we do. Okay, so we are like embodied humans in this like shared reality of like rich embodied sensory information. Uh, and we read other people's accounts of this reality, right? And we like compare it against ourselves and we're like, well, do we believe that? Have I experienced that? Uh, and then we write up our own accounts. And like, this is all like a really beautiful system uh, where we're like trying to make sense of everything together in this like exchange of information, right? This is like, the core of all art and science and literature and like beautiful knowledge building in the world, right? We're just trying to like, understand things together. Um, and what we've now done is take that <laughs> um, like whole base of, of writing uh, and feed it into a large language model, which has encoded a bunch of patterns in its network uh, and then formed some kind of like representation of the written record of humanity uh, in its memory. And that model can now generate text that's very predictably similar to everything it's seen before. And now here's the tricky bit that we're trying to figure out, is like, how much does that generated text relate to that reality? 
And in some sense, like it is fully unhinged. Like this model cannot check its claims against reality because it can't access reality. It is like a bunch of neural nets like in a computer. It does not have a body. Like it does not have some channel for it to access and check things. Um, but it's a bit like a fuzzy memory of reality, which is where this gets complicated. It is based of what, on what we've written about the world, but it can't validate its claims. Uh, and we politely call this hallucination, which is like when language models say things that like we know not to be true about the world. Um, and in a way, it's like a terribly smart person on some kind of mild drugs. Like it's confused about who it is or, or like where it is, but it's actually really still quite competent. Uh, and this disconnect between its seemingly superhuman intelligence and its incompetence is one of the hardest things for us to understand and resolve. Uh, and a big part of this limitation is that these language models only deal in language, right? And language is only one small part of how a human understands and processes the world. Like we perceive uh, and reason and interact with the world in ways like spatial reasoning and embodiment and a sense of time and planning and vision and space um, and consciousness. And like all of these are pre-linguistic things that like exist in completely separate parts of the brain to language. Like when you look at MRI scans of like when the language bit of your brain lights up, like it's like genuinely a separate section. And it's not that language isn't important, but it's absolutely not the whole of how a human interprets and interacts with the, interacts with the world. So generating text strings is not this like end all be all of what it means to be an intelligent human or to understand an intelligent human's world. Um, and so, yeah, <laughs> the second bit, um, language models are also different uh, in their social context in that they have a very strange relationship to our social world. So everything you and I say is situated in a social context, right? Like I'm uh, assuming everyone here has like a very unusually high um, technical literacy. Um, and so I'm going to talk to you in a way that I wouldn't talk to like my writer friends or my aunt. Like you just have a very different set of shared context with me. Um, and it, the same thing as if I meet someone who's from another culture or from another discipline, I know I don't have as much shared context with them. So we're always adjusting the way that we communicate to the people, um, like what we know about the person we're talking to and how much shared context we think we have. So like if I met someone from like Shakespearean England, we could communicate, but we'd have trouble on some things. And not just because we're speaking like a different dialect of English. It's like, we don't have the same assumed morals and values. We don't have the same assumptions about like how society works or how science works. Like there's a lot of stuff that we'd have to build up together. Um, so the point is that there is like no truth or knowledge outside of a social context. Everything we say is, in a conte is contextual and rests on shared context. Um, but a language model is not a person with a fixed identity, right? Like they know nothing about your social context when you're talking to them. Um, and like, they take on different characters depending on how you prompt them. And they don't hold fixed opinions. And they are not speaking from one stable social position. This actually makes some people claim that they're like objective or like more reliable than people who have all these like strange social biases. Um, but the thing is, is they definitely do represent a particular way of seeing the world, right? Like we train these models primarily on text scraped from the web. Like they do include like books and Wikipedia, but it's honestly a very small percentage compared to Common Crawl, which is like this huge scrape of the web. Um, and it's also like 95% English language uh, scrape. Um, so they kind of represent this like generalized view of this like majority English speaking westernized population who have written a lot of stuff on Reddit and like lived between about the year 1900 and 2023. It's like most of the opinion being promoted by these models. Which like in the grand scheme of all of history and geography is like this like incredibly narrow slice of humanity, just like the smallest amount. Uh, it obviously does not represent all human cultures and languages and ways of being. Um, and we're taking this like already dominant way of seeing the world, at least in our historical moment, and then just like generating a ton of content that reinforces that same dominance. Uh, and we just like don't have enough data from people who have lived far in the past or who are from minority cultures where they don't have a lot of written, um, written language to them. We don't really have enough data to train models on them, at least like not right now. We maybe don't have the right techniques. Like we would hope this would improve with time, but it's kind of hard to do without the data. Um, and if I put my anthropologist hat on here and then like look at this problem, it just feels like exceptionally tragic. It's like our entire discipline of anthropology is all about trying to expand the collective understanding of how diverse human cultures can be and help people realize like both how unified we are as a species, but also how flexible and adaptable human culture makes us. Uh, it's like far weirder and more wonderful than we can imagine. Like every ethnography that you read, you're like, oh my God, I can't believe humans could possibly live like that. Like we are so strange. Um, so this is a quote from Tim Engold, who's a really um, fantastic anthropologist. He's very famous. And he says, every way of life represents a communal experiment in living. The world itself is never settled in its structure and composition. It is 
continually coming into being. Um, so yeah, so generating a mass of content from a very particular single like monoculture way of seeing the world is funneling us down back into that monoculture, um, which feels like shutting down a ton of cultural possibilities and diversity for all the ways that we might live in the future. Uh, you know, not to mention all the existing cultures and languages that we might lose by doing this. Okay, lastly, um, generated content lacks the potential for human relationships that human content has. So when you read someone else's writing, it's a little bit like an invitation to connect with them, right? If it's someone you're reading on the web, you can reply to their work, you can DM them, you guys can meet for coffee. Ideally, you know, become friends or intellectual sparring partners. Like I've had this happen with so many people. Um, there's always someone on the other side of the work who you can actually have a relationship with. And like a lot of us, I think, would argue this is the whole point of writing on the web. Like, otherwise, you're just writing alone in your room, and it's actually not that fun. Uh, so this is a still from the film Her, which is like now this canonical reference point for like parasocial relationships with AI. Um, so this is Joaquin Phoenix, and he's like having this wonderful relationship with his personal AI, who lives in his earpiece in his ear, uh, and he grows like in de increasingly distant from all the humans in his life, and he like falls in love with his AI, and then the AI like grows bored of him and leaves, and he's heartbroken. So this is like clearly a lesson saying that like we. Um, Trying to have emotional relationships with AI leaves, leads to unfulfilling consequences, right? Like people are already trying to use agents um, to set up like girlfriend chatbots. Like this is a very popular thing, um, right? They're trying to use them to fill an emotional void that usually a human would fill, um, and they obviously cannot fulfill all the needs that like humans have for each other, right? They cannot hug you, they cannot come to your birthday party, they cannot get a drink with you, they cannot truly empathize, right? They cannot like tell you about their experiences grounded in reality. Um, so generated content can't facilitate any kind of real fulfilling human relationship on the other end. Okay, so that all sounds quite bad. Again, like the deep breath break. Um, I now do want to talk about possible futures. These will not all be dark. Um, this is, I'm gonna say roughly over the next five years, I definitely don't wanna speculate beyond that. Um, I could also obviously be writing about all of these. I'm just kind of doing a little bit of like extrapolation from what we're currently seeing. Um, this is going to be a non-comprehensive list. It's going to be mu um, not mutually exclusive. Um, these are just kind of themes and trends that I expect to happen in parallel. Okay, so first is I think we're going to spend a lot of time thinking about how to pass the reverse Turing test. Um, my original essay like mostly focused on this. Um, it's this question of how we might prove we're human on this web filled with all these generative agents. So right, we all know the original Turing test, right? You have uh, two humans and a computer in rooms and there's walls between them and they can only text, um, pass text messages back and forth. Um, and uh, if a computer can convince one of the humans that it's uh, actually a human, it passes the test. Um, on the new web, we are the ones under scrutiny, right? We have to prove that we are actually human and that we are not computers. Um, I think this is going to be quite challenging given how sophisticated these agents are, are getting. Um, in the short term, we can employ a bunch of tricks, um, like we can use unusual jargon and kind of insider terminology that the language models haven't been trained on yet. We can write in non-dominant languages that the models aren't as good at writing in, things like Welsh or Catalan if you speak them, writing in those languages is gonna give you a, a big, big leg up. Um, being multimodal, uh, so that means like writing in text or video and audio all at the same time. I think honestly we have like a six to 12 month like advantage on that before they catch up, but for the moment we can still use that. Um, and then honestly just doing higher quality writing that is like clearly grounded in research and critical thinking, they aren't, they aren't as good as us at that at the moment. Again, they might catch up, we're gonna see. Um, Another possible future uh, that's related to this is I think we're going to have much higher standards for humans as models take over more mundane tasks. So we're going to demand more of human writers because great automated writing, writing will be cheap and prolific. Uh, this raises both the floor and the ceiling for the quality of writing. Um, so at the moment, right, here's like some equal distribution of like exceptional and terrible, terrible writers on the web, right, and most of us are in this like mediocre range. So first, I think the language models are going to raise the floor because they're clearly useful for people who struggle to write right now, right? People who struggle because of their education level or because they're writing in a second language. Uh, these people's work will actually get lifted up to be a little bit better. I think there's also going to be some dual action with the mediocre and exceptional people. So uh, I think some people will actually become even more mediocre. I think these are the people who are going to try to use language models to replace their critical thinking, right? They're going to try to like outsource too much cognitive work to the model. And they're gonna end up publishing quite like boring, predictable work because by definition, that's what language models produce. Um, but I think some people are gonna realize that they shouldn't be letting language models like literally write the words for them. They're going to realize they can strategically use them as part of their process. 
So these are people who might use them to like develop initial ideas, to use them as research helpers, is to use them as debate partners, as Socratic reasoners. And I think these people will actually get much better. Um, but they will also be pushed to do more original creative work uh, because the world will be flooded with this kind of like higher, higher level of content. Okay, uh, this one, I apologize already for the, for the phrase, um, but it really perfectly captures this point. Uh, I also like polls people whether I should use it in 50-50, so I went for it. Um, we're about to enter a phrase of human centipede epistemology, uh, and I'm not gonna explain that, but you can Google it later. Um, the point is that um, if content from these models becomes our source of truth, then the way we know things is simply that a language model once said them. And then they're like forever captured in this like cycle uh, of generated information. So instead of this being our current model, right, where like the training data was at least based on some real world experience, we're now going to start using text generated by these models to train new models. And then that like tenuous link with the real world just like becomes completely divorced from it. Um, this is kind of already happening in the fact that like models are still being trained on text um, scraped from the web, and we are already publishing lots of generated text to the web. So like we are in this cycle. Um, and I think like our shared truth is already on shaky ground. So uh, yeah, it's extra concerning. Um, one real risk here is the development of what we might call scientific paper mills. So this is people using generative models to write scientific papers that claim to find things that haven't actually been tested in the world. Um, this is usually going to be findings that like benefit particular commercial or political interests. Um, so there was a study done this past December uh, to get a sense of how possible this was. So what they did was they took um, blinded human reviewers and they were given a mix of real paper abstracts and then abstracts generated by ChatGPT, which is like Chat, um, uh, GPT 3.5 is the model, which is like a little bit worse than like some of the newer models we have at this point. Anyway, they, um, they were like, okay, these abstracts are gonna be submitted to like the five highest impact medical papers. That was, that was the frame these um, human reviews were given. Uh, and they managed to spot uh, the GB, uh, chat GPT generated abstracts like 68% of the time, which is like not too bad, but it means they couldn't spot the difference for 32% of them. Uh, and they also incorrectly identified 14% of the real abstract as being AI generated. Um, so the stats are like still in our favor, but given that this used an older model that wasn't sophisticated and didn't use any like prompt chaining te che um, techniques or any of our kind of newer, more sophisticated stuff, I expect these numbers to change quite drastically. Um, and this kind of takes the replication crisis to a whole new level. Like we already weren't able to reproduce science and like prove things that are published in journals. And now it's plausible that people could write papers that just have no bearing in reality and, and get them published. Um, right, we kind of learn the harsh reality that like just because words are published in a scientific journal does not make them true, which has always been true, but now, now a bit more dramatically. Okay, next we have um, the meat space premium. Um, so I think we're going to begin to prefer and preference offline first interactions, or, or as I like to call it, you know, meat space. Um, so we're gonna start to doubt all people online, and we're, uh, the only way we're, that we're gonna be able to confirm humanity is to like meet them offline. We're gonna get a coffee with them or a beer and like validate you are a human as well. And once you do, you can then confirm humanity of everyone else that you've met in real life, right? So like two people who know both of you can then assume humanity because you have this trust network going on. Um, there's obviously gonna be knock-on effects to this. Like I expect people to move back to cities and like densely populated spaces. I expect much more in-person events. Um, I expect that like being in meat space versus cyberspace is gonna become a privilege and a premium. Um, because like we shouldn't forget, this obviously disadvantages people who can't move to dense urban areas um, or for other reasons cannot regularly get out of the house to meet people, right? This is like people with disabilities, people who have young children, people who are caretakers, um, or simply people without the financial and material means to move to expensive cities. Um, I think this sadly has a risk of like undoing a lot of the connective equalizing power that the original web did. Um, so a natural follow-on to this is to, you know, put it on the blockchain, right? Uh, creating on-chain authenticity checks for human-generated content uh, on the web is something that I have heard a lot about from people. Um, so this means something like some third party verifies that you're human in real life and then gives you some cryptographic key and then you like sign all your published content with it uh, and that's all linked back to your identity. Um, I'm not a, like an on-chain person, so like I don't know the details of like what this would involve, but I know other people here are inter interested in this stuff, so like take care of it, right, for us, that would be great. Um, but this is like a real world thing. Uh, this is WorldCoin, and this is like a scary orb that scans your eyeballs and confirms your identity and then like gives you this cryptographic 
key and then you can like sign all your content with it. Um, ironically, or perhaps appropriately, this project was um, co-founded by Sam Altman, who runs OpenAI, which like makes most of the large language models that people use. Um, he's now just like on the board versus being a co-founder, but um, he clearly sees like the problem coming that he partially created. Um, I'm also expecting any day now that Elon's going to announce this like new purple check on Twitter that confirms your humanity. It's only going to cost like $30 a month. You don't actually need verification. You just like check this box. It's like, I am a human. <laughs> so, okay. Those were all like a little bit negative. Um, so let's do something a little bit hopeful. Uh, I think we are going to be able to fight um, fire with fire. I think it's reasonable to assume that we're all going to have our own personal language models helping us filter and manage information on the web and find good quality stuff. So uh, I definitely expect these to be like baked into browsers, kind of, on, or maybe even just like on OS level. Um, and these specialized language models will be able to do things like maybe identify generated content. I think that's still up in the air. But they can like debunk claims. They can flag misinformation. They can hunt down sources for us. They can curate and suggest high quality content for us. Like they can solve the search and discovery problems that like a web filled with crap would cause. Um, we're obviously going to have to design these like very carefully because it gives a whole new meaning to the filter bubble if like everything is filtered through this language model. Um, I think we're also going to find it absurd that anyone browse like the raw web without their personal language model in the middle. Um, in the same way, I think that very few of us would voluntarily like log on to the dark web and just like click around and see what's there. Like I think we know what's there and we don't really want to look at it. Um, so the filtered web I think is uh, actually going to become the default. OK, we are, we are almost done. <laughs> um, the question that I want uh, everyone to kind of think about or leave here with is, um, which of these possible futures would you like to make happen or not make happen? Uh, we have a lot of people um, who are kind of sprinting to build, uh, frankly, very shallow interfaces on top of chat, chat GPT. Uh, like all the big companies right, are trying to like, figure out their AI play. And like their employees like DM me, panicked, being like, what should I build? <laughs> uh, I think it's good to point out here at this point that like, generative AI uh, is not necessarily the destructive force here. Uh, the way we're choosing to deploy it in the world is, uh, and the project decisions that we make will expand the dark forestness of the web um, or, or hopefully solve some of it. Um, obviously, I'm going to say now, if you are working on a tool that enables people to churn out large volumes of text without fact checking and critical thinking and then like, publish it to every platform in parallel, like, Please stop. That is like very obviously bad and like not helping the situation. But if you're not doing that, you're probably you're probably fine. Um, okay, so like let's talk about what we should be building. Okay, I tried to come up with like three snappy principles for building products with language models. Um, I expect these to evolve over time, but this is kind of my first pass at it. Um, the first is going to be to protect human agency. The second is going to be to treat models as tiny reasoning engines and not sources of truth. Uh, and the third is going to be to augment cognitive abilities and not replace them. OK, so first, um, protecting human agency. Um, the generative model system um, always starts with like, this human prompt, like, we're like, hey, you should do some stuff. Uh, and in the agent model, we hand that off to an autonomous agent, right? And then they, like, they go do a whole bunch of stuff. Uh, and the locus of agency here is definitely with the agent, right? Herein lies the path to self-destruction, right? This is what most AI safety researchers are very concerned about, right? We wholesale hand off these complex tasks to these enormous language models, and then they just like go off the rails and kill us. It's like somehow the narrative. Um, the more ideal form of this is that the human and the AI agent are collaborative partners. So this is sometimes called human and loop systems. Um, so they are doing things uh, together. They are not like you know they are like one symbiotic system. And the locus of agency is still sitting within the human, but there are these very short feedback loops between the agent and the human. There's a lot of close supervision of inputs and outputs, and we're giving very limited power to the agent. Um, this is nice in theory, but obviously like, who holds the agency in a system like this is actually kind of a spectrum, and it's quite opaque. It's very difficult to understand like, who, who is the agent at what point. Um, so I think this is going to involve like, quite a lot of difficult design thinking and difficult design work. Um, actually, Jeffrey and I were like talking yesterday um, about how there's a bunch of research done in the 90s on like agency and interfaces that apparently we will need to read. And he, he promised to send me the link later. <laughs> uh, and I can add it to the, to the talk slides. Um, this ties into principle number two, which is to treat models as tiny reasoning engines uh, and not sources of truth. So at the moment, the, most, uh, the way that most of us use language models is kind of as like oracles, right? We like ask them questions, and then like we take things they write and like wholesale turn them into essays. Um, and then this is where we get issues like hallucination and like detachment from reality. Like that all becomes a big problem. 
But I think they're much more interesting to think of them as these very small reasoning engines trained for very specific predictable tasks. Um, so one alternate approach we could do is to start with our own curated data sets that we actually trust. So this could be um, scientific papers that we know are valid. This could be our own personal notes database. This could be public databases like Wikipedia. And then run many small specialized language models over them that do particular tasks, right? Like they, they summarize, they extract data, they could find contradictions for us, they can compare and contrast, right? They could group things by certain variables, they could stage a debate. Um, and some of these will have to pull on like their generalized training data, but there's much less risk of hallucination uh, when you put it into this scoped setting. Um, and we will always kind of have these very small observable inputs and outputs with this kind of model. You can always check exactly what the model is doing at every step. Um, and then we also like don't treat put, treat the outputs as like, final publishable stuff. They are much more like interim outputs that we are using for our own critical thinking until like we finally write the thing that we want to share. Um, also, with smaller models, we could like run these locally versus having to rely on something like OpenAI uh, for all our language model stuff. Um, so language models are actually getting quite good at these very specific reasoning tasks. Like we use them a lot in a lot of AUTS products. Um, but this is a paper that came out of Microsoft Research a month ago um, where they explore how GPT-4 has uh, much better reasoning capacities than previous models. Um, so to quote them, GPT-4 can solve novel and difficult tasks that span mathematics, coding, vision, medicine, law, psychology, and more without needing any special prompting. Um, they do caveat, that, caveat this by saying, like, it still makes mistakes, right? They're not like, claiming this is like proto-AGI. Um, but it can do things that seem like it would need some kind of primitive reasoning skills. Um, I don't think we should take this to mean like it is reasoning. I think that's a very tricky and loaded word. Uh, and I think we should all still be very skeptical of this and like, you know, more research needed. But it also uh, shows we should maybe rethink what we think these models are capable of. Okay, lastly, is to augment cognitive abilities, don't replace them. Um, so language models are very good at some things that humans are not good at, like search and discovery through huge sets of data, doing role play and being able to change identities and characters quite quickly, um, being able to rapidly organize and synth synthesize like huge amounts of data, uh, and then turning fuzzy natural language inputs into very like structured computational outputs, right? These are its strengths. Uh, and then humans are good at tons of things that like language models are absolutely terrible at, like checking claims against physical reality, right? Um, they have no long-term memory and coherence, right? Embodied knowledge. They have no understanding of what it is to dance or run or like do anything sophisticated with a body. Um, they have no social context. They have no emotional intelligence, right? Um, so we should be using models to do the things that we can't do, uh, not things that already that we are already quite good at and quite enjoy doing, um, right? We should leverage the best of both of these like kinds of minds. Um, Saying that um, language models are like an alien mind that we've just discovered is a very popular metaphor uh, in the community. We hear it quite a lot. Um, it's a little bit like we've just discovered them and we don't quite understand how to use them. When we say aliens, I like think of this, <laughs> which is like maybe appropriate for like AI risk, like doomerism. Um, but I do at least like the metaphor of it being a new species we have to figure out how to relate to. So um, Kate Darling wrote this really great book called The New Breed. Uh, and it argues, she's talking about robots here. She's a, robotist, a roboticist at MIT. And she's talking that we should um, think about robots uh, as if they're animals, as if they're some kind of companion species who complement our skills, right? And we work with them. We have a lot of um, established um, social, cultural, like legal structures for how we work with animals and how they fit into our lives. And she's saying we should apply that to robots. I think that extends quite naturally to AI. Um, so we should just expand and augment our cognitive capacities by respecting their unique strengths and our unique strengths. OK. Um, oh, this is a pretty good article that's like very much on that approach um, of blending human and AI, AI capabilities. Um, so this was posted to Less Wrong in February. Like, I don't love Less Wrong as a community, but they occasionally have some good AI thinking stuff on there. Um, OK, good. Thank you. That was uh, a lot. Thank you all for listening. Uh, again, if you want to see the slides of this talk or links to anything I referenced, it's on this QR code or that URL, maggieappleton.com slash forestalk. Um, I'm on Twitter at Mappletons. Uh, I'm sure there are lots of people who think I've said at least like one utterly sacrilegious or like misguided thing in this talk. Um, so you can still try to main character me on Twitter like while that's still online. <laughs> cool. Cool. Questions? I was waiting for. <laughs> <laughs>
I'm out of good questions for today, so here's a silly one. Um, do you think there's going to be some kind of equivalent of radiocarbon dating, but for large language models, like GPT-4 being the last good one because all the other ones are trained on themselves? Gosh, that's really interesting. Uh, I hope so. I don't know how we would do that. I like that idea, though. Someone should do that. <laughs> Any others? So I feel like an artifact of being extremely online and being connected to some of these tools means that we as tool users and tool creators are accelerating away from the less online. Um, what do you think about that divide? Um, uh, and as you said, this was for us. And we're like, great, a Mappleton summary that we can put in our brains. What do you think the message is for the less online? Um, that's, ooh, that's really interesting. Um, yeah, like I agree. A lot of the points I'm going to do definitely most relevant to an audience who gets most of their truth and information from the internet. And I, yeah, I know a lot of people do not. Right, or just like on not on Twitter all day, like that's like a, a most of the population. Um, <laughs> um, I don't know what the message for them would be. I like don't want to jump to like uh, they should have to learn everything about language models. Like I don't like the idea that we always have to burden non-technologist people with like our business and like make them understand programming and make them understand models. Uh, and I don't also don't want to frame it as like we have to protect them as if like we have all the power, like us, the world savers. Like that's like the AI safety's like favorite thing to, to jump onto. It's like <laughs> we will save you all from this problem we invented ourselves. Um, I don't know if I have a good answer to that. I want to think about it. Yeah. Over here. Thank you so much for your talk. It was so fascinating. Um, I'm a marketer, so I'm triggered right now. <laughs> sorry, sorry. <laughs> um, but in a really good way, in a really interesting way, because, yeah, I've definitely seen, you know, like Jasper, like showing up on my my Twitter, <laughs> like marketing to, to me to use it. And um, it makes me think. So you, you have that example of you have these different agents and they're creating, they're basically doing content marketing, social media marketing, email marketing. And they they have to do this in a way because that's the marketing cycle, like that's the funnel, that's like how we are trained to do marketing, um, and what has been effective. So I'm wondering what your thoughts are on in these possible futures. Do you? I know this is kind of a big question, but like, what do you think would be like the future of marketing in that sense? Um, it's a good question. Uh, and I think a lot of industries are going to have to like grapple with this of like what's our role. Uh, I think it ends up. I don't want to like say manager because that sounds like a little bit depressing, but a little bit of like orchestration. Um, you know, if this all goes really well, like you know, not some of like the dog futures I painted, uh, right? Where we have uh, these short feedback loops and like we are very much like the agency is with the human, and we have these like wonderful tools that can help us do our jobs, but it's not like replacing us or like taking over too much agency and kind of like running a mark. Um, then like as a marketer, it's like you would have a whole bunch of tools that just like let you do less busy work and that you can just kind of like spin up a whole bunch of maybe marketing content and then you can review it and you're like the quality control barrier in this. So I hopefully it would just like make your job a lot easier, but it would be more one of like orchestrating many agents who do lots of micro tasks for you and then you're like validating their work and like then feeding it through or approving it. Over here. Uh, hi. Yeah, so GPT-4 can kind of already deal with images. And we've had like Natasha Jake and other researchers working on this social aspect of AI, of how AI can understand emotions and even try to replicate them. And we have Felix Hill working on stuff like embodied AI. Both of those researchers have been doing that even before we had ChatGPT. Uh, and once, you know, everything, Thing like that gets connected. What's left for us? <laughs> okay. <laughs> um, I think I'm a little bit skeptical of. I know there is work happening on trying to make uh, like AI systems more embodied. Um, I'm like quite skeptical of them achieving 
maybe what we would think of as like human human level intelligence. I think they could achieve other levels of intelligence that is not human intelligence. But I also think when we go through the, like, okay, we'll just like cell grow it in a lab. I'm like, at that point, just make a baby. Like it's much easier. Like it's much cheaper. Like why spend just billions of dollars like making a fake human to like achieve AGI when like we are really good and we're actually quite easy to make if anyone's like noticed. Like it's not that hard to make a, okay, it's kind of hard to make a baby, but it's not that hard. Um, yeah, that's like my current take on it. I don't know what's left for us if, if we do manage to make the creepy robot baby. <laughs> Over here. So you were saying that you could train on like specific data sets. So theoretically, you could make customized spam and customized phishing emails. That yes, uh, I was going to mention somewhere in this talk that like someone should really do the information security version of this talk because it is dark and awful. And like I didn't really want to go too much into it, but like deep fakes are imminent. Like you can like fake someone's voice very easily. Like targeted phishing and spam attacks, I think, are definitely like a, a risk that are about to come up. Like. Yeah, I would say InfoSec is hiring right now. It's like what I would imagine. <laughs> Hi, Maggie. I'm Jasmine. Hey. I'm working on Trellis. Um, considering working on something after Trellis, which is like a worker co-op proof of humanity org. And I'm wondering, you mentioned WorldCoin. Um, I'm curious if there are other proof of humanity like researchers or organizations or like any other alternatives that you think highly of or anything that you wish would exist? Um, I actually don't know of any. Like when I wrote the original essay, um, I don't know, I had a lot of, you know, great comments on Hacker News. Um, and some of them were pointing out uh, this thing of like, oh, but we'll just like solve this with like on-chain humanity. But no one pointed me to any companies or people doing it. I only found WorldCoin. So it doesn't mean they don't exist, but I actually haven't come across any. Any other questions? Oh. Uh, one of the things you spoke about that I really liked was the use of autonomous agents as small like blobs of reasoning for doing things like taking unstructured data and so on. And uh, earlier when you and I were speaking, you mentioned doing a lot of research on knowledge graphs and so on. So I guess I was curious whether any of your research has involved using LLMs alongside data logger knowledge graphs or anything like that and if you could speak to that a little bit sure sure uh yeah we're definitely exploring this at ORT. um so like the product we make is yeah for for researchers they can like type in a, a topic and then we give them essentially structured data that's extracted from scientific papers um and one thing we keep trying to figure out if we can do uh and we can't quite get gpt4 to do it yet or at least to the high enough quality that we want is but is to like figure out okay can we just like make a knowledge graph of like I don't know, every like claim made across like all these scientific papers or like every piece of evidence and like connect them all up. And it's like, it's like a citation graph, but with the actual content of the papers, um, we haven't found the outputs are high enough quality yet. It might just be like, we haven't found what we call the right recipe, which is that like chain of many small language model calls and other tools all interconnected. Um, but it's definitely something we want to explore. And I know there are other people working on this. They're like trying to create big knowledge graphs using LMs. It's like the structured data piece. It's probably a good startup idea if anyone, anyone wants to. <laughs> cool. Thank you, Maggie. Thank yeah. you so much. Thank you.